thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so I want to introduce myself again. Uh, I will tell you today a story about code reviews. Uh, and while I was preparing this talk, there were some topics that kept trying to creep into it and take the entire thing over. So I've decided to start with addressing these uh, head on. So today I won't tell you about how you should all be doing code reviews and how awesome they are. I also won't try to convince you to use Android, uh, use Kotlin for your Android development needs, as if you're here, I assume that you are already doing so, unless you're still trying to get your management on board with this idea, uh, which I also don't have time to cover uh, within the confines of this talk. But if you're interested in, for example, how we did this, I am very happy to talk about it later on. Finally, I also won't be listing all the awesome things that you can find in the Kotlin standard library. The good news is that all of these talks have in fact been given before by magnificent speakers. So if today's Kotlin talks aren't enough for you for this week, you can spend the weekend uh, checking out some of these. Uh, you don't have to take pictures of this. I will be sharing all the resources and slides later on. Okay, so what will I talk about? Uh, I'll talk about what we do at Outsoft. And what you need to know about us is that we're an agency. And the applications that we usually create, as far as the Android part of it goes, are uh, fairly small. So we usually have just a uh, couple developers uh, working on each of them, with someone in charge, a senior engineer, an architect, if you will. And this person would review the work of everyone else on this team. Uh, but this is a very informal and casual thing, as at this scale, there's simply not much of a need for process and methodology. In contrast, uh, the application that I will talk about is something that we have started as a greenfield endeavor, and we have written it in 100% Kotlin. And it's a huge application in contrast to what we usually do. So we are already past uh, 100 screens uh, in the application, way past it, in fact. And we have been working on it uh, since last September. Uh, and even that is just the Android application part. So that was already preceded by months of design work and consultation with domain experts. At the peak of the project, we had almost a dozen uh, different Android developers working on this. The core team is about seven people or so, uh, half of which are junior developers. Uh, and for almost everyone on the team, this was their first opportunity to write Kotlin code for production. So we knew upfront that we were going to be in for a lot of learning on the go during the project. And therefore, we established very formal and rigorous code reviews where everything would be uh, going through me when uh, it went from a feature branch into th the main development branch. Uh, these were the gateway style code reviews uh, that you might know. Uh, and they served two purposes for one. Uh, it was code quality assurance and bug prevention as much as possible. And on the other hand, they were, of course, a learning tool where I could uh, attempt to teach everyone uh, to use Kotlin correctly. Uh, to give you some idea of the scale of the project, uh, it's not huge on an, in on an industry scale, uh, but you might compare these numbers to whatever you might be working on. Uh, we are almost celebrating 100,000 lines of Kotlin code uh, very soon. All right, uh, let me uh, put up a chart here. And don't worry, this won't get very scientific. Uh, in fact, there is no real data behind this chart whatsoever. Uh, I will be making up all of it. Uh, so this is just a very crude visualization of some of my thoughts on uh, learning Kotlin. So on the horizontal axis, I will be plotting time. And the vertical axis will show the Kotlin-ness of the code for the lack of a better word. Uh, so this would be how much you're making use of advanced Kotlin features, uh, how much you're writing so-called idiomatic Kotlin code, and that sort of thing. And the very uh, made-up theory here is that there's some sort of optimal level of doing this. So this is where everywhere everyone on your team uh, is comfortable working with the code. They can read it easily. They can modify it uh, with confidence, and uh, that sort of thing. So as far as learning Kotlin goes, there this tends to be uh, in a couple different phases. Uh, I really should name these, but I uh, didn't manage to uh, come up with appropriate names for each phase uh, in time. So we'll just be uh, numbering them. So there is the first phase, uh, which is when 
as I'm sure you have seen uh, with other people and probably experienced it yourselves, people uh, uh, tend to write very Java-like code just with Kotlin's syntax. So at this point, code reviews uh, help to push people towards adopting even basic features of the language. Then in the next phase uh, would be where people suddenly start getting the language in some way. Uh, so this is where they uh, go and uh, learn things about the language on their own. They experiment, experiment with new features and uh, develop quite quickly uh, using the language. At this point, code reviews can uh, shift more towards uh, making sure that the code that's being written using all these new features is still performant, it still stays readable, and uh, that we prevent any subtle bugs that would arise from uh, misuse of all these new features that people are learning. Uh, then, at least in my experience, uh, there tends to be this phase up there as well, uh, which is when people overshoot this optimal amount and they start writing truly ma magical and clever Kotlin code. Uh, it's very easy to uh, misuse all the features that the language gives you. Uh, so putting everything in a single expression, nesting all these scope functions that you can find in the standard library, and so on. And these are really the interesting phases as far as code reviews go. Uh, for completeness's sake, uh, there are about two more phases. So after significant pushback during code reviews on these things, people tend to just abandon features for a while, uh, just to play it safe. Uh, and then slowly but surely, they uh, tend to find their way back and approach this optimal level uh, yet again on their own. Okay, so uh, we'll look at some code examples for the first three phases, starting obviously with the very first one. So uh, right here, uh, before we look at code, there are some uh, general habits, uh, either from Android development or Java development, that uh, need to be uh, addressed. So uh, these are things such as enums, which are uh, traditionally frowned upon on Android uh, due to performance reasons, I suppose. Uh, but even Google has been saying for about two years now that you are just fine to use using them, uh, unless you're writing the framework itself or some sort of very tight inner loop like that. Then there's lambdas and functional types in general. Uh, these are, of course, uh, new for a lot of developers who have only been doing uh, Java and the Android flavor of Java 6 to 7-ish uh, and haven't seen uh, functional programming uh, languages yet. So these are something that uh, Kotlin introduces for a lot of people. And in many cases, you can get away with using functional types instead of, for example, introducing new listener interfaces and those kinds of things as you would in Java. And finally, type checks. I don't know about you, but uh, as far as my university Java courses went, uh, these were uh, essentially banned from the code. Uh, we pretended that the instance of operator uh, didn't exist, and uh, we were supposed to solve everything through object-oriented design and polymorphism and visitor patterns, I suppose. Uh, but really, I think that type checks are just fine uh, in our modern application code. And in Kotlin, they are uh, very convenient. On one hand, you get smart costs after successfully performing a type check, which is very neat. And there is also the safe cost operator, which lets you translate a question of type conformance into a question of nullability that you can then handle with all the tools that Kotlin gives you for null handling. So these are some general things that we try to get rid of. And then let's jump into some code examples for this first part. So uh, we're going to uh, first write this function in a very Java-like manner. Uh, this is uh, obviously, uh, hopefully, uh, trying to update the colors on a pie chart. So we are receiving the pie chart as a parameter, as well as an array list of entries, whatever those may be. Then what we're doing inside it is we're creating a brand new array list. Uh, for each of the entries that we received, we are extracting a color value out of, out of them and placing them into this newly created list. And finally, we are setting this list of colors on the pie chart. So this is, uh, hopefully, uh, you can see that this is a very uh, Java-inspired uh, code sample. And we can do uh, quite a few things to clean this up. So for starters, looking at the signature, uh, this function performs an action on the pie chart itself. So it would be a very good idea to make it an extension on the uh, pie chart type instead of uh, having to pass it in as a parameter. Uh, it makes for a much uh, neater call site. And then there is this array list that we're taking as our uh, parameter still. 
And this is a very specific type uh, to be requesting from your uh, callers. Uh, there is no reason for uh, wanting especially an array list uh, implementation here. We are not making use of this fact in any manner. So we can just use the standard Kotlin library interfaces. And this is a uh, good practice in general. If you have collection types in your function signatures, whether it uh, is the receiver, the parameter, or the return type, you should prefer these uh, standard library interfaces. And if you can get away with it, use the read-only variants of them. Then moving on to the next line, there is this uh, creation of an array list by calling its constructor. Uh, we can uh, do slightly better in Kotlin, although this is debatable whether it's helping at all. Uh, but we can use uh, standard library uh, factory functions for this as well. Uh, but if we look at the next few lines altogether, then we see that uh, we can simplify all of this code away, uh, as this is a very uh, common pattern uh, that we would bring over from Java. We have an existing list, we are creating a new one, and for each entry in the old list, we are uh, creating some new value and putting it into the new list. Uh, so this is really just a map operation. So instead of doing a for each here, we can use a map, in which case we don't need to add colors to the list ourselves one by one. In fact, we don't need to create the list ourselves at all. We can just have this uh, map function do all of this for us. And if we look at the uh, function uh, altogether now, then we see that this intermediary variable that we had for the colors array, uh, or c colors array list initially, is no longer needed, so our entire function simplifies to just this very short piece of code. So this is the sort of basic, thi basic thing that you would be fixing up in this first phase. Uh, let's move on to the second one, uh, which is again more about performance and bug prevention. Uh, in this phase, uh, we'll look at uh, many collection-based uh, examples. So this first function here is supposed to fetch whatever an examination result is based on a given ID. And the way that we had this implemented initially is that we were first getting a list of item groups. You can uh, think of these item groups as being a domain model, and then the examination results would be the corresponding presentation models that can be created from the item groups. And that's in fact what we were doing. So we were mapping each of these item groups into an examination result. And since we just needed the one with the uh, specified uh, ID, we were calling the first function to perform this search within the examination results and select for the single one that we would return. And hopefully with this visualization, you see all the work that we are doing uh, unnecessarily in this function. So uh, depending on how expensive this mapping is between the objects, we have been pr uh, burning a lot of CPU cycles on uh, doing that mapping, and we have surely been allocating a lot of instances in memory that we are then just immediately throwing away uh, into the garbage collector. So the fix for uh, these performance uh, issues would be to do this the other way around, perform our search first, and then do just a single mapping. So the way that this would look like is we would search within the item groups, and then finally, when we found the correct one, we would uh, map just that single one without having to loop over a whole bunch of elements in a collection. Uh, this is a contrived example, of course, uh, but it's a good, uh, good piece of advice in general that if you start adopting all these Kotlin collection handling functions, then you should pay attention to performance and what order you're calling them in. There are many times when uh, swapping a filter and a map operation won't affect the end result of your code, but it will have significant impact in terms of performance. For another collection-related example, uh, here's a piece of code that gets a list of events from somewhere, and then we're trying to determine the ones that are still upcoming. The way that we do this is we filter the events and we check for the ones that have a date which is still in the future, uh, determined by a comparison to an offset date time dot now call. And similarly to the uh, previous example, uh, the issue here lies in the fact that filter is going to uh, run the lambda that we're passing to it for each element in our initial collection. So for each comparison, we are allocating a new offset date time instance. 
uh, not only is this wasteful in terms of memory, uh, but if we are extremely unlucky, it may even lead to bugs. As, uh, as we are going through our list, we are creating new instances uh, of offset date times, which are representing different points in time. So we aren't even comparing all of these events to the uh, same uh, instant in time. The fix for this is very simple. Uh, we would just need to extract uh, the offset date time creation and compare each event to this single instance. Uh, my advice for uh, making sure that your developers know uh, the cost of these uh, collection functions is to have them implement some of these themselves. So for example, uh, have people write a simple filter map group by operation perhaps, and that way they will uh, have a feel for uh, the loops that are uh, within all of these functions. For the last example in this phase, uh, let's look at some Bluetooth API, because who doesn't love the Bluetooth API? So here's a function that's supposed to start a, a Bluetooth low energy scan. The way that one would do this is that you would fetch the default Bluetooth adapter and then ask that adapter for a Bluetooth LE scanner instance. Then you would have to set up a whole bunch of parameters that we're just gonna skip for now. And finally, you would scroll scanner.startscan, passing in the parameters that you have set up. Except that the Kot Kotlin compiler won't let you do this. Uh, because it turns out that this scanner that was returned from the adapter is nullable. So you need to do some sort of null handling uh, at this point. And if a developer who is fairly new to Kotlin but already knows the basics of null handling is doing this, then their first instinct might be to do this, use a safe call so that uh, if scanner happened to be null, then uh, we don't uh, crash with an exception. We are just simply not calling start scan on it. And the issue is that uh, while this code is safe in terms of crashes, it's I, at least as far as I'm concerned, it has a bug in that whoever is calling this uh, start Bluetooth LE scan function uh, will never know if this function performed whatever it was supposed to do in the first place. So this safe call is of course uh, just shorthand for this uh, syntax. So uh, it's uh, essentially performing a null check and is leaving your else branch completely empty. Uh, and that else branch is where you could do potential error handling. So throwing an exception from the function or uh, perhaps returning a Boolean value on each of these branches uh, just to somehow indicate to your caller if the uh, function has uh, in fact succeeded. Uh, so every time that you use the safe call operator, be aware that you should only be doing so if the call that you are making is truly optional and nobody will care if it doesn't happen. All right, uh, let's move on to the third phase and look at some uh, examples mostly related to model classes. The first one of which is about a user's daily fluid intake, which is also my cue to drink, of course. <coughs> right, so we had this class that had a quantity uh, first up. So this is however much uh, fluid the user has consumed so far in the given day. Then we had a recommended amount, which had a default value. This seems sensible enough. If we don't know enough about the user to give them a customized recommendation, we may want to use this. But then this is what we had as the last property. So this uh, property had a default value that used the previous parameters uh, passed into the data class to do some computation, divide the previous values, do the multiplication, round it to an integer, make sure that it's a sensible percentage value. And this is the amount of logic that I would rather not have a uh, data holder class perform for me. So there are uh, multiple solutions to uh, extracting this logic, but one thing you might want to do that's often forgotten as a uh, possibility is you can just pull this uh, out of the class entirely, make it an extension on your data class, and then have the getter of this extension uh, property contain all this logic for you. And speaking of data classes, I'm on a very lighthearted uh, crusade against them. Uh, there are many cases where you can get away without using uh, data classes per se, just using regular Kotlin cl classes. They are very capable on their own. So I don't have time to go into the pros and cons of each approach, uh, but this is a plug for my blog in case you want to read my thoughts about this. 
Okay, uh, let's see another model, which of course is no longer a data class. Uh, so the thing that's interesting about this one is that it has a lot of default values, uh, especially this pattern where every nullable thing was initialized to null by default is something that emerged in our code uh, at some point. I think this was caused by the fact that if these properties were inside the body of a class, then the compiler would force you to initialize them to null by default or to something by default. Uh, and so people started doing this everywhere, uh, giving default values to everything that was nullable, even if those were uh, constructor parameters. And this might not be an issue uh, generally, but uh, something that can happen is that someone is trying to create an instance of this class and then they, uh, because these default parameters are there, they can uh, quite easily forget to provide all of the parameters that they could have provided. So for example, in this case, I'm trying to create a, an ingredient instance, and I left off the last parameter because my code was already compiling, uh, this constructor call was already valid, and uh, I might have had a valid image ID on my hands that I could have passed in here, uh, but uh, due to the fact that there were all these default values there, uh, I had the possibility to mess up this constructor call. Another uh, rather dangerous thing in this class is this uh, random UUID call for a default value. So if you have a very complex uh, computation in these uh, default values, or uh, especially if you have randomized values in them, uh, be uh, very cautious about uh, doing something like this, because if someone ends up uh, using these default values uh, by accident, uh, when they don't mean to, you will have a very hard, tri hard time uh, tracking down where these values uh, originate from. So in this case, uh, if we don't need these default values, I would just clear all of them up. At this point, I would be forced to make a decision about whether I want to provide all of the parameters. Uh, because uh, my compiler, because my uh, constructor call would no longer compile, and at this point where I have uh, this many parameters for a constructor call, and there are primitive values in it, and even a null, uh, I would start naming these uh, constructor parameters. All right. Uh, so for the last code example, let's talk a bit about coroutines. So we have been using coroutines uh, for our threading needs, as we are in a pure Kotlin project. Uh, we don't need to interoperate with Java code. So uh, we had uh, the opportunity to just uh, go with coroutines everywhere. And we did this in a very restrained manner. Uh, we uh, had basically two rules for how to use them. We were starting all of the coroutines in a given layer uh, in our view models. Uh, using the launch coroutine builder, and then in the very next layer of the application, we were placing all the coroutines on a background thread with just a simple with context call. So uh, we didn't have coroutine handling code all over our uh, application. Uh, people weren't launching coroutines in various places. It was very well defined, and uh, it turns out that even though there we even had people who were new to Kotlin, uh, we had almost no trouble from using coroutines. They worked very uh, neatly. However, uh, they even worked a uh, li little bit too well, so it turned out that they were too easy to use in some cases, as we'll see in this example. So what we have here is a function that's supposed to validate a list of measurements uh, that it's receiving as its parameter. And the way we did this is we were filtering uh, this list of measurements, and we were getting a validator for each of them for their given type. So this type might be a weight, a height, or uh, some value like that. And then we were checking that its value was within the minimum and maximum uh, values specified by these validators. Um, with a multi-line lambda like this, uh, I would also recommend naming the incoming parameter uh, in this case. Okay. Uh, so this code worked as you would expect it to work, except that it was terribly slow. And uh, why it was slow wa wasn't apparent during the code review, which I, of course, did in a browser uh, in a web environment. Uh, but as soon as we looked at this same code in an IDE, it was very apparent what the issue was. It was that little symbol right there. So it turned out that fetching a validator was, in fact, a network call. 
So uh, within this filter, which again is just a for loop uh, in reality, we were going out to the network for each element and getting some uh, validation data so that we can uh, perform the uh, check that's required for the filtering. So after discovering this, uh, which by the way would be very, very hard to implement if you were using, for example, a callback-based API. This is the sort of mistake that would be very hard to make, but with coroutines it's very easy. Uh, so after we've discovered this, the solution of course is uh, quite simple. We were just prefetching all of the validation data before this loop. We associated each of the validators uh, with the type of measurement that it can validate. So this gives you a map uh, from the measurement types to the corresponding validator instances. And finally, instead of going out to the network within the loop all the time, we were just doing a lookup within the map, which is essentially free in comparison. All right, uh, so that's it for this uh, contrived curve and for the code examples today. Uh, let's get back to the uh, story time part of the talk. So, uh, about learning the language, uh, of course everyone has a different way of being able to uh, absorb new information and we have used a uh, bunch of resources for learning the language. So the first of these would be the official uh, documentation uh, and kotlinlang.org as well as the Kotlin koans uh, which were uh, mentioned by some of our developers when I asked them about feedback. Uh, for both the code reviews and the learning process. Then there were books, a couple of them. Uh, I especially can't recommend Kotlin in action enough, uh, even though JetBrains isn't paying me to promote it, unfortunately. Uh, so this book not only explains the syntax of the language, but also a lot of the motivating concepts behind it, as well as uh, some implementation details that are very interesting if you uh, are a Java developer originally. Then there are uh, video courses, of course. Uh, again, JetBrains makes a few of these, as well as there are the Google uh, Udacity courses, which were already mentioned in one of the keynotes this morning. And one of our developers actually swears by those Udacity courses. Um, something more unique to us is that we have weekly meetings of all of our Android developers, uh, as much as that's humanly scheduled as possible where we uh, discuss issues that ev anyone has faced on that given week, how we solve them, any new libraries we found, general industry news, and that sort of thing. And on these sessions, uh, since we started adopting Kotlin for production in last May, uh, we have also been learning Kotlin together. So uh, these took the form of me live coding uh, various Kotlin code examples, and the uh, great uh, advantage of doing something like this together is that it can be a very interactive experience. So if someone has a question about the code, if they would like to try something else uh, in the given example, then we could just change the code right there on the fly, see if it would compile in a different way, see how it, beha it would behave if it ran at all, and that sort of thing. Then there were, of course, the code reviews themselves. Uh, the pro of these is that even when people don't have time to attend meetings and read books and uh, things like that, code reviews are still constantly happening, so they are a constant source of learning, no matter what happens. And finally, there were a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultations that we did. Uh, these fall into two categories. The first one would be the ones that are prompted by the code reviews themselves. So people would ask me to explain my comments in more detail uh, in person or perhaps to uh, oversee them actually fixing the issue to make sure that they are uh, doing what I suggested them to do uh, and so on. And the other kind would be when people from completely different projects would come to me with any sort of general Kotlin related issue. Uh, so all of these would be essentially short pair programming sessions uh, that just happen uh, on the spot. And my advice to you is if you're trying to be the one who's uh, spreading Kotlin within your organization, then be always, uh, whoops, uh, be always approachable uh, with Kotlin related questions. This will put a lot of confidence uh, into both your colleagues and hopefully your management uh, about adopting the language, which can be otherwise a uh, generally scary thing. And it might go without saying, uh, but in practice it's often not trivial. 
uh, if you have all of these resources, make sure that all of your people know that these resources are in fact available to them and where they can find it. So if it's hidden in some obscure file share or if it's behind an account that not everyone has access to, uh, then you should fix those things. Uh, right, uh, I couldn't uh, keep myself from giving some general code, re code review advice, uh, so just a single slide of that. Uh, plan with having code reviews from day zero, so they do take a significant amount of time, so include them already in your estimates if you are going to have them. Uh, don't try skimping on the reviews or rushing them when your deadlines are approaching, as that's how you get bugs that will just take more time to fix later. Make your code reviews as cooperative and uh, a conversation as much as possible. So instead of giving orders in your comments, ask questions about the code. Uh, you may very well be missing something about that piece of code that the author knows a lot more about. And finally, if you are, in fact, uh, asking for uh, changes directly, always explain why you want a given change to be made. Uh, otherwise, you will uh, fall into the pattern of once telling someone to change an A to a B, and then you'll see them uh, change every A to a B all over the project, uh, regardless of the context. So make sure that if you are asking people to change their code, they understand why you are asking for those changes. Uh, okay, uh, what's next for us in terms of code reviews? Well, uh, we had a very pleasant experience with them, and ideally, we would like to do a lot more of it. Uh, not just this way, where someone is the supposed expert on a topic, but all across the board. Uh, this, of course, uh, makes sure that all the code is, again, accessible by everyone. And uh, our code reviews uh, went so well uh, that I even had one of our junior developers tell me that they have been going out to the merge requests that were submitted by other people and reading the discussions under those as well, uh, just to get even more of the experience to learn from uh, the things that were happening there as well. Um, right, uh, and another thing uh, regarding code reviews uh, that you have to take into account is the tooling that you have for them. So we did have continuous integration and uh, static analysis of various kinds set up uh, for this project initially. However, I think we still didn't have quite enough of this. For example, formatting was something that we spent time on, uh, especially around the start of the project. So we were leaving comments about it, people were fixing it, we were going back and see if that they have fixed it, in fact. Uh, so uh, that's the sort of thing that you want your tooling to do for you and that you shouldn't be spending uh, human time on. Okay, uh, to wrap things up, uh, I asked uh, our team for many uh, different pieces of feedback uh, related to code reviews and they helped me a lot to prepare this talk. And one of the last questions uh, on these uh, forms was uh, what they missed about writing uh, Java code after about nine months of working with Kotlin. So here are just some of their uh, responses directly. So our Android developer uh, told us that they had a significant lack of semicolons in the code. Uh, one of our senior developers said that they would never be uh, looking back after working with Kotlin. And there was someone who just left a single smiley face uh, here which I, th I think uh, tells you all about our attitude towards the language. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for your time. Uh, if you would like to get these slides and uh, both the resources that I already mentioned and even more, uh, you can find all of these on my site and you can also follow me on Twitter if you're into that sort of thing. And I believe we have time for questions if anyone happens to have them. Uh, what tool are you using for these presentations? Because it's awesome. <laughs> um, this would be Microsoft PowerPoint. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I like staying on topic. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you, you, you mentioned static code analysis and uh, continuous integration. Could you please tell us what you're using? Are you, are you going with Fastlane or...? Um 
sure. what tools have you been sure uh, so with? as far as continuous integration goes we are using GitLab's own uh, CI and uh, for static analysis uh, we are using uh, sonar and we have all the uh, things that we were using with uh, Java based projects as well so uh, the regular Android lint and uh, find bugs I believe and we also have detect uh, hooked into sonar uh, it also has a plugin for it all right, thank you. Can I ask one more question? Sure. <laughs> All right. For code reviews, are you doing only one code review or two co code reviewers? How many of them? Or uh, is it a one-on-one -on -one review or do two people review the code, for example? Yeah, uh, we were doing one-on-one -on -one reviews, so... Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Thank you for the talk. Um, regarding the extension functions, you had the example where you updated the colors of the pie chart and uh, then in the data class example, yeah. there was another extension function. Um, what's your take on um, like writing those extension functions, which, which are nice and uh, um, I wouldn't argue about that, but there's uh, this opinion that if you own the code, why why you're not doing the the usual thing like putting the update function in the class where you do the update, and um, so like where where do you draw the line? Yeah, um, it's on a case by case basis for sure. Uh, so there's a lot of design uh, planning to be uh, done around uh, whether you're implementing things within the class or you're pulling them into extensions. So we try to, uh, for the most part, uh, keep just the core functionality of uh, classes uh, inside of their body. And then if something isn't stri strictly required to be inside a class for it for uh, in order for it to function, then that's something that we might be pulling out into an extension just to make the class shorter, essentially, and easier to uh, see its core purpose. Uh, and then any functionality that can be added on externally is usually just uh, added like that. Uh, there are very good articles about extension-oriented design uh, by even some JetBrains people uh, that you can go and look up. Thank you. Um, I would ask another one. Uh, you mentioned detect um, and sonar. Yeah. So I, uh, sonar lint, as far as I know, has quite a few uh, lint rules for, for Kotlin, I think 31 in the latest release, <laughs> which, which is in comparison to Java code, which has hundreds, uh, a bit few. So what's your experience with detect? Is that uh, more useful and actually brings up cases that you miss as a human? Um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, how much of the issues we saw were uh, provided by each of the plugins. Uh, but Detect definitely has a lot more functionality uh, than most of the other things. So there are many, many rules in Detect. Uh, I think that most of the things we found with static analysis were a result of uh, that plugin. Uh, one discussion we had in the team when we were moving from Java to Kotlin was in Java you have this rule, one class, one file. In Kotlin you really don't need to follow that rule. Yeah. Do you have a good um, like hint how to to for a policy? Because we were a bit like, okay, we can put all the small enums in one file, but yeah, does it improve the code quality or does it improve readability? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, we tend to stick with the default organizations of having every uh, having the packages and folders match and having one class per file uh, almost all of the time or a collection of extensions in a file, in a lot of cases that belong together, uh, which are, for example, an extension for the same type. Um, sometimes we do throw multiple, very small model classes in, the in a single file. Yeah, we too. <laughs> it depends, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question um, about code reviews. Um, sometimes when we review the code of a um, developer who is not very familiar with a language or a library, um, I sometimes um, have an urge to make a new commit, commit to the pull request and uh, do a small refactoring instead of commenting in, uh, in Bitbucket. Um, 
but sometimes it's not received very well by developers. Um, what's your take <laughs> on that? What's your experience? Yes, uh, so my approach is uh, unless we are pressed for time, uh, in which case I would sometimes go in and fix things, but even then I would uh, send people a message and show them the comments that I've made so that they can see the changes that I uh, make on their feature. Uh, but unless we are very pressed for time, uh, if there are these refactorings that uh, I think would be a good idea uh, in that given, to given uh, piece of code, then I would just uh, leave comments and let people do it themselves, uh, just so that they learn more from it, hopefully. Anyone else? Okay, uh, so you'll be able to find me here all day. Uh, if in the morning you uh, couldn't get your hands on uh, the very cute Raven Derlich Android stickers, uh, which were uh, down there uh, amongst all the other ones, you can also find me. Uh, I still have a bunch of them on me. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it. Thank you.